Hello. You can't trust anybody. They told me it was full. And I can see empty seats up there. I reckon it's the, I blame the snow, don't you? Everybody who can has gone to the snow, but they're probably warmer than we are here. Now then, it's been a very strange few days for me. You know that I've been personally attacked, my motives have been impugned, and I do that thing that we all do where we think, was, was I insensitive? Did I get it wrong? Were there mistakes I could have avoided? Uh, did my antennae fail me? And it's begun to change in the last two days when I've talked to people who, who know what I'm talking about and who recognize what I'm saying and who find it helpful because it was never meant to be destructive or skullduggerous. But you know, when the Murdoch press rings you up and says, oh, you know, that ageing loon Jermaine Greer has just said whatever they think I said, and some poor person, some poor person's knee jerks and they say what they would say, if indeed I had said that, we end up going down the veil of error until we disappear into complete misprision and misunderstanding. The misprision and misunderstanding has gone on for too long. We are going to have to sit down and listen. But before we can sit down and listen, we have to have deserved to be talked to, to be told how much it hurts. And it's humiliating to confess things like that. And we have not yet deserved to hear it. Now, you were promised tonight that I would reflect on the uses of rage in achieving social change and its waste when it's misdirected, its mythology and its history. You've also been told that someone out there thinks that anger is my octane. I had to Google octane. I realized that I too thought that octane was kind of like a fuel additive that would give you extra mileage. And of course, that isn't what it is at all, as the boys could have told us. Uh, what it ought to mean, if I have high octane, it, it should mean that I have a high tendency to auto-ignite. <laughs> so don't be surprised if I burst into flames. <laughs> but he could all, but I rather fancy that what was meant was that I have low octane. The more octane, or equivalent of fuel has, the greater its resistance to auto-ignition. So if I have high octane, I don't rise to every bait that is trailed across my path. I consider that I have behaved with saintly patience this week. <laughs> now, I don't point this out because I'm beside myself with fury, but because the esteemed commentator who feels entitled to sum up what he takes to be my motive force doesn't know diesel from petrol. <laughs> Whatever you do, don't lend him your car. Rage, however, is a serious subject. I want to make it clear to you that it's not the same as indignation or contempt or disgust because all of those feelings position you with regard to the subject. Indignation, you assert your authority to criticize and condemn. Rage is not irritation or even irritability, or even bad temper. It's not ire or wrath. It is beyond all these things. Rage is blind and speechless. Someone like me, who spent her whole life explaining herself to my students, to my readers, to my public, cannot be afflicted with rage. Rage cannot do that. Rage doesn't even want to explain itself. Anyone who pleads, argues, expounds, demonstrates has to be moved by love and optimism. It doesn't matter how testy you get, the fact that you're still talking, that you're still explaining, 
means that you have faith in the person who's listening to you. You believe that truth will eventually triumph. Even though you are misunderstood virtually all the time, and sometimes really mischievously, you go on believing that there's a point in what you're doing. He that has ears to hear, let him hear. Rage is what happens when you stop believing that there is any point. Rage doesn't just push you to hurt other people. Rage puts the shotgun in your mouth and blows your head to smithereens. If you write, as I do for a living, you have to be well within yourself. You can't be beside yourself. If your energy has been wasted in getting mad, foaming at the mouth, gnashing your teeth and seeing red, there's nothing creative you can do. Whatever we do in a state of rage will be destructive. As Shakespeare says, or rather, as someone else says in Richard II, in rage we are deaf as the sea, hasty as fire. I love deaf as the sea. Now you want to know it's true that rage affects social change. Here's how it does it. And again, it's Shakespeare. The gates of mercy shall be all shut up, and the fleshed soldier, rough and hard of heart, in liberty of bloody hand shall range with conscience wide as hell, mowing like grass your fresh fair virgins and your flowering infants. What is to me then? If impious war, arrayed in flames like the prince of fiends, do with his smirched complexion all fell feats in linked to waste and desolation. What rain can hold licentious wickedness when down the hill he holds his fierce career? We may as bootless spend our vain command upon the enraged soldiers in their spoil as send precepts to the Leviathan to come ashore. The person speaking, as I'm sure you know, is Henry V, describing what would happen if he sent his soldiers in to sack the town of Harfleur. It was a con. His soldiers were too weak, too hungry, and too ill to have been able to wreak such havoc. But there are plenty of examples of such horrors of warfare carried out against a civilian population in the history of 16th century warfare. And of course, there are even more in the 20th century. War is institutionalized rage. Shakespeare's heroic commander here admits that once he unleashes his soldiers in their rage, he will be entirely unable to prevent atrocity. What he describes is what happens whenever the blunt instrument of war is unleashed. The rape of Nanjing, the massacre at Milai, the savagery in Rwanda, the vileness of Abu Ghraib, all are only to be expected. And any pretense that war doesn't do these things, that there's such a thing as a clean and tidy, law-abiding war, is a lie, and we should resist it. It is easier to move the soldier to an unreasoning rage against the enemy because he is already terrified. Blind rage and utter terror affect the human organism in identical ways. Henry begs the citizens of Harfleur to surrender. And he is here describing what happens in the black reign of rage. If not, he says, if you don't surrender, why in a moment look to see the blind and bloody soldier with foul hand defile the locks of your still shrieking daughters 
your fathers taken by the silver beards and their most reverend heads dashed to the walls, your naked infants pitted upon spikes. Pikes, sorry. Once the soldier has experienced being high on rage chemicals, they can be triggered at will, but once triggered, they can't be controlled. You can turn rage on, but you can't turn it off. And this is what Henry is saying to the civilians in Hafler. Don't make me do this, because I won't be able to control what happens next. In his remarkable book, Among the Thugs, a book that has had far less success than it should have had, Bill Buford describes what happens when armies of football hooligans go on the rampage. He describes how the horde of men and boys would surge aimlessly up and down the streets, shouting and kicking bottles, waiting for something to go off. Often nothing went off and the fans milled around aimlessly. When whatever it was did go off, innocent bystanders got bashed and even killed as the hooligans laid into total strangers with boots and fists and weapons. Alcohol and other stimulants played a role as they do in warfare. Buford was horrified to realize that after a time, the more time he spent with the hooligans, the more he felt himself responding, being drawn into this atmosphere as his own noradrenaline started pumping. He quit before he was implicated in any act of blind violence. But by then he understood how that could happen, even to an educated man like himself. Armies are built on the premise that rage can be induced and manipulated. Be careful what you wish for if you wish for the return of national service. I should know because I live near an English garrison town and there the squaddies regularly terrorize the civilian population using their training to inflict better and graver injuries on civilian boys. And it's quite interesting that when the police are called, they almost never prosecute the squaddies. So there is a vein of poisonous rage that is exploited by civil society. Militarism takes the vulnerability of human beings to both terror and rage and incorporates it into a system. Each year, we encounter instances of the vileness of the procedures by which this transformation is effected. They include systematic humiliation and abuse of junior personnel, initiation ceremonies, bullying at all levels. At deep cut barracks in Surrey, Four recruits have died of gunshot wounds. One of them, who died in 1995, had been continually ab abused verbally and physically, attacked by a gang wearing gas masks as he slept, and thrown through a window after answering an officer back. His body exhibited five bullet wounds, only one from close range, Yet the verdict remains suicide. The one woman among the four who was shot through the forehead six months later was said to have been forced to have sex with an officer. The bullet that was in her head has since gone missing. Sound familiar? The bullet, uh, the suicides or murders are all dots on the trajectory of rage as it is exploited by the military establishment. I don't have to remind you, I hope, of the psychological devastation that has driven Australian servicemen returning from Afghanistan to do away with themselves. In the United States, 
16 army recruiters have killed themselves since 2000. The usual explanation is post-traumatic stress disorder. The soldiers were all being treated with antidepressants. Depression is by far the commonest mental illness. Very few of the number, of the vast number of depressed people in our societies will shoot or hang themselves. What is being overlooked in the pathology of these, in dealing with these cases, is the pathology of rage itself. Rage is addictive. People dependent on rage body chemicals cannot settle down. They cannot just get over being poisoned for months on end by rage come terror. Suicide has always been more common among soldiers than amongst the civilian population. As rage is engendered in them by a culture of systematic humiliation and then deployed in acts of extreme violence and cruelty in the field, we really can't be surprised if they shoot or hang or drown themselves or cut their own throats. Though most of the recent army suicides had been on medication, none, I think, took the comfortable route of a drug's overdose. The level of violence involved in soldier self-destruction should be treated as an important clue to its etiology. And the four-letter word I use for that is rage. Now, when I talk to you like this, you can see that I don't think rage is an Aboriginal monopoly. I just think that if you treat people in a certain way, rage is what you'll get. And if you are tyrannical, you can deploy it, you can use it, you can abuse it. But we are not tyrannical, are we? Wouldn't we wish to heal this thing, to deal with this poison? The most dangerous kind of rage has been called implosive rather than explosive. In the person who cannot let his rage burst out, for whatever reason, timidity, lack of opportunity, culture, self-repression, it builds up to toxic levels that can be lethal. It is rage that sends kids into schools with automatic weapons to massacre their schoolmates. Three quarters of the school shooters in the United States had been bullied. Let's have a think about some of these case histories. The perpetrator of the high school shooting at Pearl, Mississippi in October 1997 gave this text to a friend. I am not insane. I am angry. I killed because people like me are mistreated every day. All throughout my life, I was ridiculed, I was beaten, always hated. It was not a cry for attention. It was not a cry for help. It was a scream of agony. Cho Siung Hui, who killed five faculty and 27 students and then committed suicide at Virginia Tech in April 2007, is described as having almost never opened his mouth. As soon as he started reading, the whole class started laughing. He is said to have suffered from something called social anxiety disorder which resulted in an inability to speak, or mutism. I'm sure you're making the connections in your own imagination as I speak to you. School shootings are sometimes called rage uprisings. And I discover with horror that school shooters are actually popular with kids. There are many internet sites which celebrate them to which kids send blogs expressing their rage at being pushed from pillar to post and having no possibility of explaining their own situation or why it is that they choose um, eccentric ways of reacting. 
One case that interests me particularly is the case of Jeffrey Wise, the perpetrator of the killings at Red Lake, Minnesota in 2005. He described his life as 16 years of accumulated rage, suppressed by nothing more than brief glimpses of hope which have all but faded to black. He shot and killed seven people, injured 14, and then killed himself. Wise was a Native American, an Ojibwe. When Jeffrey was nine, his father committed suicide after a day-long standoff with police. He was then living with his alcoholic mother in Minneapolis, St. Paul when she suffered severe head injuries in a drink-drive accident resulting in permanent brain damage, she was hospitalized. An 11-year-old Jeffrey was sent back to the Red Lake Reservation to live with his grandfather, who was the first person he killed on that terrible day in March 2005, along with his partner. A reservation worker said, there's a lot of that kind of loss and devastation here. And you will hear similar kinds of statements about what pass for reservations, open air prisons, if you like, in this country. Red Lake has not a little in common with Palm Island. We are all, I hope, familiar with the work of Chloe Hooper who won a Walkley Award for her articles on the death of Cameron Dumaji in the Palm Island Police Station in March 2004. Helen Garner has described Hooper's book on this subject as the more moving for its intense restraint. Intense restraint is almost an oxymoron. What is being restrained in Hooper's telling is not simply grief and horror, but rage, her own and other people's. She speaks of Elizabeth Dumaji, Cameron's elder sister. She seemed haughty, as if controlling just a steady rage. Part of Elizabeth's control mechanism is her Christian religion, which lies like a stone slab over the lifetime of suffering that has brought her from the jail she was born in to the open-air prison of Palm Island. Elizabeth knows from the start that there will be no justice for her brother. Though she has never expected anything different, her self-control cracks when the verdict exonerating Senior Sergeant Chris Hurley comes down and she aims a blow at a social worker's car windscreen with her blunt machete. As a result of that one crack in her armor, she lost all the children who lived with her, grandchildren, great nieces, and foster children. They were all taken into care. Chloe Hooper is also aware of the rage of the white men on Palm Island. And this is what, what I have been accused of stirring up and in some way justifying. She writes of Hurley in the courtroom. Penned there, he looked rotten, as if there was something poisonous inside him. You could almost see the bitter rage rocking in his head. His brother shared this rage and expressed it in a wildly intemperate article in the Police Union Journal. But you understand how this rage is born in a situation as unjust as Palm Island, where it is literally impossible to do the right thing. No matter how hard people like Chris Hurley work, and there's no doubt that he did, to bring order into black communities the black communities over which they were placed in authority, no matter what sacrifices they made, these lives, their lives were not easy, but the Aboriginal people continued to resist them, continued to malfunction, denied them what they longed for, respect, recognition, gratitude. And it's too much, it's too much to ask of anybody 
And you know, if you're thinking intervention, you're going to make more of these cases, more of people ripping up their own lives to try and heal a situation that cannot be healed because we haven't actually begun to treat the underlying problem. Chloe Hooper describes the passive resistance of Aboriginal people. Black communities were the opposite of white communities. This is what they're showing by their misbehaviour. Black communities were the opposite of white communities on purpose. I'm no white man, said the Dumaji kid who didn't bathe. It was as if the locals were saying, you think we're all abject. Well, here's what abject is. Here is chaos and self-destruction, unreason and cruelty. And that same pattern can be found in every continent on this planet, where hunter-gatherer peoples have had their lives rendered completely meaningless by colonization. No matter how many white idealists wind up working to improve the situation on Palm Island, or how hard or how long they work, the resistance of the Aboriginal people will not lessen. White people who devote their lives to serving black people expect to be trusted, loved, honoured and respected when at best they are simply tolerated. Hooper struggles to be even-handed. She's worried, perhaps, that some fool might say that anger was her octane and question the reliability of her testimony. But grief and indignation pulse beneath her careful prose. Here is her description of the parallel careers, very restrained indeed, of Hurley and Dumaji. When Hurley was doing rugby training at a Christian brother's school, Dumaji was in a youth in detention centre. By the time Hurley was setting up a sports club for the kids on Thursday Island, Cameron had a child and a broken relationship. As Hurley picked his way along the police career path, the other man was like his shadow. But the bitter joke of reconciliation in Australia is that the lives of these two men were supposed to be weighed equally. Now, you know, if I said that reconciliation was a bitter joke, it would probably be put down to my habitual bad temper and my anti australianness Is there any chance that I would be understood to be merely speaking the truth? It is the truth, after all. I'll say it again, as coolly and as calmly as you like. Reconciliation in Australia is a bitter joke. Somehow, we have to confront and deal with the problem of rage. Now, in the grip of rage, you know, you can't sit quiet as you work on a letter to the editor. You can't even speak. In the grip of rage, you kick the wall and break your foot. The farmer who puts the shotgun in his mouth and pulls the trigger isn't suffering from depression. He is demented with rage. Its cousin is despair, but despair cannot drive violent hands. If anger is to be useful rather than destructive, it must be recollected in tranquility. Tranquility is not available to people whose lives are poisoned with helpless rage. They cannot perform rage. For them, rage is not histrionics, but a hard reality that knots their guts and robs them of the few and inadequate words they have. Those of us who opted for satire in the 60s protected ourselves from the corrosive action of rage by turning our contempt to laughter. You won't find too many Aboriginal people doing stand-up or penning obscene comic strips. When we do, we'll be getting somewhere. Now, the performance of rage is interesting, and it has a function. Let's take the example of the erstwhile pastor of everybody's darling, Barack Obama. When the Reverend Jeremiah A. Wright, Jr. stands up before his congregation at the Trinity United Church of Christ on Chicago's south side, he is ready to perform rage. After 9-11, he roared, Americans chicken, America's chickens are coming home to roost. 
He rewrote God Bless America as God Damn America. Reverend Wright is variously described as fiery, noisy, caustic, incendiary, harsh, blunt, my soul brother. <laughs> and yet Reverend Wright's church is the preferred worshipping place of Chicago's buppies, the black and upwardly mobile, which is why the Obamas worship there. Wright performs righteous rage for his congregation. He vituperates, execrates, excoriates, hurls imaginary fire and brimstone, erupts like a volcano. But what shakes him is artificial rage, rage as an art form, as unlike real rage as the haka is unlike real fighting. His is a rage dance rather than rage itself. The performance has to be believable. He really has to pound his fist on the pew. His breath must really rasp. His throat sound really raw. His job is to cleave the general ear with horrid speech, make mad the guilty and appall the free, confound the ignorant and amaze indeed the very faculty of eyes and ears. That's Hamlet asking what the great actor would do if he had the cue for passion that Hamlet has. Hamlet is envious of his histrionic ability, his operatic talents. 